Well, good morning everyone and welcome once again to our service here at Dornach Free Church. It's a great privilege to be able to meet from week to week and to share a God's word with you. And our prayer is that as we do so once again today, that he would bless it to all of us, that those of us who are the Lord's would be strengthened and encouraged and nourished by the word, and that anyone who may as yet not know the Saviour would, even this morning, come to know personally. Our heart's desire for all is that we might taste and see that God is good. So before we reflect on God's word, let's turn to God in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that our times are in your hands. We thank you that you're in complete control of all that is going on in our world. We thank you that nothing happens out with your knowledge. And we thank you that for your people, you promise to work all things together for good. We come to you today thankful that in Jesus Christ, you have so loved the world that on that cross, a loving God reveals to a lost world his great desire that they might be saved. And we thank you that you've given us good news. We live in a day when we've been hearing a lot of bad news coming from all over the world, not only in connection with the coronavirus, but also in relation to many other things that are causing so much unrest right across the world at this time. We thank you that in the midst of all the bad news, there is this wonderful gospel message that you have given to us to share with others, to make known that there has been born in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord, and that that Saviour fulfilled all that was required of him as he lived a life of full obedience to God which none of us can claim to have lived, and as he took the penalty due to us for sin himself in his own body on the tree. We thank you too that the news we have is of a saviour who has conquered death and who has ascended to God's right hand so that we have there, if we're trusting in you, one who is interceding for us. And if we're aware of our sins today and of our unworthiness, one who promises to plead our case as our advocate. If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. So we praise you for the Gospel and we ask that you would always help us to you know, be willing to share it with others, irrespective of what the response to it might be. We do pray again today for all who are in need as a result of COVID-19. We pray for families who have lost loved ones. We remember those who are suffering and who may be you know, in you know, close who may be near death. Lord, if any of them don't know you, may you reveal yourself to them, even at the 11th hour. We remember you know, all who are ministering to the needy, you know, all who are in the front line, and we thank you for each one, whether they be the medical personnel or involved in the caring professions or in whatever other capacity. We thank you for all those you know, who are demonstrating the you know, love for their neighbour, in these days. Who is my neighbour? Your word asks. And Jesus himself makes it very clear who our neighbour is. So help us not only to say that we love you, but help us to love our neighbour as ourselves. You know the many different personal issues that people have at this time in connection with all the uncertainties of these days. May each one be able to cast their cares on you and may each one know that you care for them. Remember, we pray today, our leaders, and grant them that wisdom that is from above. Save them from relying on their own wisdom and help them rather to look to the one who is more than willing to guide and to give them the understanding that they need. Help us, Lord, to act responsibly and not recklessly. And as many of us do feel being separated from loved ones and wonder when, it is that we might be able to meet up with them again. 
help us to wait until uh, wait the assured that it is safe so to do give us the grace of patience uh, as we wait for you uh, to bring an end uh, to this crisis and we ask that you would enable us to be thankful for all the mercies that we receive from your hand day by day and that you would bless your word to us as we turn to it again this morning glorify your own name in all that is said and done for jesus sake amen even although you perhaps weren't uh, able to play with your friends because of all that's been going on. And I'm sure that over these past weeks, some of you would have felt a little bit thirsty. Uh, if I was talking to you uh, face to face, I would be asking you just now what your favourite drink is. And I'm sure that um, some of you would uh, give very interesting answers to that question. Well, I have a drink with me today that I'm sure not many, perhaps not any of your parents 
would like you to take much of its good old Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola is very pleasant to drink, but it might not be all that good for us to drink. But there is something that makes Coca-Cola stand out from all other soft drinks, and that is 7X. Now you might be saying, what on earth is 7X? Well, I don't know, because the only people who know what 7X is are the people who make Coca-Cola. And it's a secret ingredient that has been used by the makers of Coca-Cola from the very start. And other people and other manufacturers have been trying to find out what it is, but the Coca-Cola folk simply won't tell them. But it's what makes the difference between Coca-Cola and every other drink. And as I was reading about that the other day, I thought, you know, that in the Bible we're told that there is a missing ingredient to life that all of us suffer from until and unless we come to know Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes the difference. 7x is what makes the difference to Coca-Cola from every other drink. Jesus is the one who can make the difference in your life and in mine. Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it in all its fullness. In other words, that we might really enjoy life as we enjoy God. And I hope that you will all come to know Jesus if you haven't already. We're going to be looking at a passage this morning where Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And just as some of us might enjoy a drink of Coca-Cola on a hot summer's day, or you might enjoy a much more healthy drink on a hot summer's day, all of us need to come to Jesus and to receive him every day as our own Lord and Saviour. And I hope today that you will know Jesus, because it is only in knowing Jesus that we find out what life really is all about. May God bless you. Now, and may God help you to know him and to love him and to live for him more and more day by day. Thank you once again for watching and I hope for listening.
This morning I'd like to read uh, two short passages from God's Word and the first of these is from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 12. You would say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously, let this be made known in all the earth, shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And our other reading is from the Gospel according to John and chapter 7 and verses 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus is here addressing people who know that they have a problem spiritually. And he's using an illustration that we can only understand if we read it in the context in which we find it. We're told that the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths has been taking place. This was a feast that occurred during the beginning of the month of what we would call October. For seven days there was a feast and the Jews lived in booths made of three branches and this was to commemorate their forefathers pilgrimage through the wilderness. On each of the seven days the high priest would go to the pool of Siloam and he would draw out water in a golden vessel. This water would then be poured out on the altar where the parts of the sacrifice were arranged. As the water was poured out, the people would sing to the Lord and shout for joy. It was a time of great celebration and great joy for the people. And this celebration continued day by day for seven days. The eighth day was called the great day of the feast. And on this day, Sacrifices were again offered, but there was no singing, there was no shouting. It was known as a solemn day of repentance before the Lord. Another element was missing on this day as well. There was no water poured out on the eighth day. And it was against this background of, of silence and symbolism that Jesus stood up and used this illustration in relation to himself and to the spiritual needs of men and women. Here Jesus is proclaiming himself to be the fountain of living water and as he speaks thousands would have been listening to him and all of them would have instantly understood the significance of the illustration that he was using. If anyone thirsts, 
let him come to me and the The people would think of Isaiah 12, that verse which we, we read a few minutes ago. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. They would think of Isaiah 55. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. The illustration would be one that they would all understand. But what does it tell us about Jesus? And what does it tell us about the people who are being addressed? Well, first of all, we see the intensity with which Jesus speaks. On the last day of the feast, the great day, that's the eighth day, Jesus stood up and cried out. Jesus knew that the next day the feast would be over. The crowd would be gone. Many of those who would leave Jerusalem on that day would never see Jesus in the flesh again. Jesus knows that he would never have the opportunity again that he has on this last great day of the feast. And so he realises that this is the time to present them with a very simple, very searching and very straightforward gospel message. An evangelistic appeal. For many of them, Jesus knew that it would be now or never. And so he speaks earnestly, he speaks from the heart. There's an intensity of feeling behind the words that Jesus utters. Jesus knows that the matter is urgent. And Jesus makes that clear in the very way in which he addresses them. What a great lesson we can learn from this for ourselves. We live in a day when even those of us who preach the gospel can become somewhat complacent. And when those of us who sit under the gospel may also be complacent, thinking, well, there'll be more opportunities. Whereas the truth is that none of us know when this might be for us our final opportunity. It's so vitally important that we avail ourselves of the time that we have in order to impress on those who don't know Jesus, that this is the day of salvation. As the old hymn puts it, have you any time for Jesus? As in grace he calls again. Oh, today is time accepted. Tomorrow you may call in vain. So Jesus is here speaking with urgency, with intensity, with an, an earnestness that we would do well to emulate ourselves. He sees this gathering of men and women before him and he addresses them and he says that if anyone thirsts let him come to me he says and drink. See how inclusive it is. Anyone Jesus says and the inference is that everyone should be thirsty spiritually. Everyone should realize their need of God. Of course as we're going to see, not all do. But these words are addressed to all who do thirst, to all who do understand and who do realise that they need God. The offer is wide and broad. The offer is extended to anyone who is thirsty. You know, there are some people who perhaps realise their spiritual need, but who are all bound up by the thoughts that they're excluded from the gospel offer. That because they don't fit into the categories that they imagine others fit into, that they are somehow excluded. But Jesus is here saying clearly, if anyone is thirsty, so if you are aware of your need of God, if you are aware that without Christ you're lost, if you have a desire in your heart to know the Lord, these words are addressed to you. And Jesus is saying to us here, as he speaks 
these words that if we're Christians, we too should, like him, be prepared to impress urgently on those who are outside of Christ and who come to us, as sometimes they do, acknowledging that they don't know the Lord. We need to impress on them that there is a saviour for them to come to, that there is a God who wants them to believe and who will in no wise turn them away if they come. But you see, the implication is that not all do thirst. And that really is an important point for us to consider. Not everyone who hears Jesus speak realises truly that they need the Saviour. And we can have people in our churches who week in, week out, hear the gospel message and yet do not thirst. They come and they go. They listen with one ear and they let it go out the other. And they don't really realise their spiritual bankruptcy. There are many who are relying on their own goodness, on their own righteousness. For as long as we rely on anything that is of ourselves, then we're not really spiritually thirsty. We're imagining that you know, somehow we don't have the need that the Bible says all men everywhere have. So this morning, as you know, we listen to these words, can I ask, are you thirsty? Or have you yet to realise your need of a saviour? Ask him to show you your need if he hasn't done so already. There are those who just don't get it. There were those in this crowd who didn't get it. And there are still those who, no matter how plain the message may be, still fail to realise their need of God. How much we ought to pray that God would open the eyes of those who don't know him to see their need. So we have the intensity with which Jesus speaks. We have the inclusivity as he's addressing all those who are thirsty and the implication that not all are. But then there is this invitation. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Last week we saw Jesus in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we mentioned that there are numerous Bible passages where we have the similar words addressed to us. Come to me. We're going to look at another one next week. It's interesting that the Bible closes with a very similar invitation in Revelation 22, 17. But what Jesus is saying here is very interesting. He's saying, let him come to me and drink. Just as last week, we saw the importance of knowing God personally through Jesus. So here we're reminded again of the personal nature of genuine salvation. Let him come to me. It's obvious what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, and the implication wouldn't have been lost in the crowd, that he is the only one who can satisfy spiritual thirst. And in so saying, it is clear that Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, and it's still the same today. As I mentioned at the beginning, the, the, the Feast of, of Tabernacles, as it took place, involved the high priest going to the Pool of Siloam and drawing out water in a golden vessel. And that was reminding the, the Israelites of what had happened long since in the wilderness, where the Lord provided water from the rock. The New Testament tells us that that rock is pointing to Christ. Now, and it is now only as a result of Christ being smitten, of Christ going to the cross and doing all that he has done for us, that we can have our spiritual thirst quenched. On the cross, Jesus cried, I thirst. And the reason he thirsted on the cross was in order that those who believe in him might never thirst again. And so Jesus is here inviting us to come and inviting us to have our spiritual thirst quenched. And he's telling us that only he is able to do that for us. As the old hymn says, which we sang 
or heard some last week. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water thirsty one. Stoop down and drink and live. But can you say with that same hymn writer Bonner, I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. Well, here Jesus is giving us uh, an incentive to come, because not only has he been addressing a problem, but he is affirming a certain promise. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then he goes on to make clear that Jesus is referring there to the Holy Spirit. In the prophecy of Isaiah, which again the audience would have been familiar with, in chapter 58, we're told that the God's people would be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And here Jesus is speaking of the work of the Holy Spirit and he's telling his people that as they know him and trust him and have their spiritual thirst quenched by him, so his Holy Spirit lives in their lives and shows them more and more of what the things of God are all about and gives them a spiritual satisfaction that nothing in this world could ever possibly give. Again in Isaiah, we have this prophecy. I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So we're given this incentive here by Jesus now as he promises that whoever believes in him, see again how inclusive that is, whoever, that includes you. Whoever believes in me, does that include you? Well, if it does, he says this, and he's quoting from several Old Testament scriptures, kind of putting them all together. And he's saying that the word of God says to whoever believes, and I hope and pray that's you, that out of hers and her heart will flow rivers of living water. And John makes clear that he's talking about the Spirit who dwells in the hearts and lives of all God's people. And as the Holy Spirit works in our lives and enables us to live for God, so we can come to experience for ourselves what the woman of Samaria experienced. As Jesus said to her, that everyone who drinks of the water that he will give will never thirst again. The water that I will give him, Jesus says, will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Now, as I close, maybe you're so familiar with a message such as this, that you're not really responding to it with the urgency with which you ought to respond to it. There's a story told of a, a village factory that was very noisy, and the, that was going on for so long that the people of the village got used to the noise of the factory. So used to it that all of them were able to sleep every night without even being disturbed by the noise. One night the noise stopped, the machine broke down and everyone woke up. Maybe we're like the people of that village. We're so used to the sound of the gospel that we're sound asleep under it. We never know when we will hear it for the last time. May we all wake up to our need and wake up to accept Jesus before it sounds for the last time in our ears, before the day of opportunity and of grace is past. The great danger is that we can put off coming to the Lord. I want to finish with this quote and I hope that it doesn't 
reflect where you're at today. Tomorrow, he promised his conscience. Tomorrow, I mean to believe. Tomorrow, I'll think as I ought to. Tomorrow, the Saviour receive. Tomorrow, I'll conquer the habits that hold me from heaven away. But ever his conscience repeated, one word and one only, today. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Thus day after day it went on. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Till youth with its vision was gone. Till age and its passions had written the message of fate on his brow. And forth from the shadows came death with the pitiless syllable now. What will you do with Jesus? The call comes loud and clear. The solemn words are sounding now in your listening ear. Immortal lives in the question and joy through eternity. Then what would you do with Jesus? What will your answer be if today were your last day on earth? Where would you spend eternity? On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. life-giving and free. 
and to be able to say with McLean that Jehovah said again in the Lord of righteousness is all things to me. Bless your word to us, we pray, and part us with your blessing. May your grace, mercy and peace be with us all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>